Okay. I'd like to thank you all very much for coming. Um, and I'm going to talk today about um, Theodore W. Allen and Hubert Harrison, who I believe are two of the most important thinkers and writers on race and class in the 20th century. They are autodidacts, self-educated, working-class intellectuals, right? Harrison never goes to college a day in his life. Allen goes one day and found it too confining. Right? That's how the story goes. So I'm going to start, and we'll just start with Allen. Here he is. He lives from 1919 to 2005. Now, he knew Leonard Zeskin and were friends with him. I think he knew Al. I don't know if he knew Bob. Um, uh, yeah, and... Um, I think it was Larry, the other fellow who was sitting here in the front row. So he, he's, some people here knew him. Uh, but here's his quick bio. He, uh, he's a working class intellectual activist. He's a former coal miner. He was a president of three locals in West Virginia. He goes into the, he goes into the mines in 1936, 37, straight out of Huntington, West Virginia High School. SMSA with the lowest rank in the country at the time, I think. Um, He's a factory worker. He hurts his uh, back in the mind and uh, winds up coming up to New York. He teaches political economics at the Jefferson School for a number of years. Um, and then in the late 50s, kind of starts a move away from what he was doing. And by the mid-60s, he's very independent. Um, he factory worker teacher. He was a postal worker with me, as was Hubert ha as was, well, Hubert Harrison was a century earlier, but he was also a postal worker, fired by Booker T. Washington. That's in the biography. And uh, in his le last years, Harrison did the homework hotline for the youth at the Brooklyn Public Library. Theodore W. Allen pioneered white skin privilege, his white skin privilege analysis in 1965. Note the date. That's 21 years before Peggy McIntosh. Um, and if you go to uh, Wikipedia and look up white privilege, the first line will say, if it hasn't changed much, white privilege theory holds that all white people benefit from white privileges. That's not what Allen says at all. Allen is clear who, who benefits. It's the ruling class who benefits. For European American workers, those privileges, he consistently argues, are not in their interest. They're like a poison bait, like a shot of heroin. What is in their interest is their solidarity with their fellow workers, you know, uh, African American, Latino, Asian. All right. He pioneers his invention of the white race analysis in 1974-75. And that analysis is in this little precy, this little short pamphlet, which is available free online, but we have some copies here at cost. Everything always at cost, right? It's, um, he writes his major work, his two volume, The Invention of the White Race, um, in 1994, volume one, in 1997. He's almost 80 years old when he's doing this, right? So <laughs> I take hope, right? Um, <laughs> and and um, in 2012, uh, we came out with a new edition, which I edited. I wrote introductions for Verso books, and it has internal study guides, right, for everyone here. This is trying to pass it on, as people have been talking about. And his last unpublished work was towards a revolution in labor history. Because those two volumes on the invention of the white race are 800 pages combined, 35% footnotes and appendices. This is what I call serious proletarian scholarship. This is serious working class scholarship. He's got great integrity. He knows the issues. He does not mean spirited. He raises them in their best light and then addresses them. There's so much in it, but he, he was thoughtful enough to offer us a summary of the argument in two parts which is available free online. All this you'll be able to get through my web page, which is here. And my web page, my name is, I, for the internet, my name is Jeffrey B. Perry. There's a Jeff Perry on Scandal. He was stealing a lot of my hits, so I, <laughs> <laughs> I make sure I use the Jeffrey B. Now, um, the uh, summary of the argument. So his shortened summary of the argument in two parts is 50 pages each part. But again, and what's nice is you can search, as you know, right, online. And this pamphlet, which he did in 75 and 76, and was reprinted recently. But I want to show you a few other things that he's written, and call these to your attention. 
for the work you're doing now. He writes White Blind Spot in 1967, co-authored with Noel Ignati uh, Ignatin at the time, Ignatiev today. This pamphlet had great impact on the student movement, particularly SDS, and then on the new left in the early 70s. And for those, again, not familiar with the history of white privilege analysis, in 1969, the New York Times ran a front page article on how SDS was calling for an all-out national campaign against white skin privilege, right? So it is rich history there. In that pamphlet, in the, the, com the more complete 1969 edition, Allen has this article, can white, worker, can white ra uh, workers crossed out, because that wasn't so much the problem as radicals, can white radicals be radicalized? You might find that of great interest. Again, free on my webpage. He writes a critical review, he writes a critical review of Edmund Morgan's American Slavery, American Freedom. Morgan's a very well-known historian, uh, professor emeritus at Yale, does a, uh, a book that's very important on colonial history. It is the one that Michelle Alexander uses in her um, book, but I don't think she was familiar with Alan. That's unfortunate because I think she would really draw a lot from Alan, but Alan's, I'll get to get in, Alan had a two, uh, two pronged critique of Morgan's review. I'm gonna talk about one of them today. We can get into the other one also. Very important article in defense of affirmative action in employment. I think people would wanna read that today. This one, race and ethnicity, history in the 2000 census, takes on added significance in light of what's going on, particularly with the Hispanic, ca Hispanic category on the census. And that's what Alan talks about in this. And he talks about how census making is political like everything else in this society. And one of the, th one of the aspects of what's going on with allowing or encouraging even Hispanics to choose a race in this US defined racial situation is that the tendency, the numbers are, that many more are gonna choose white than black for all the social pressures that are here in this society. And then what that means is the gloss of democracy, uh, uh, you know, of a white supremacist democracy uh, of a majority or at least a plurality gets extended a bit further into the future. And his last one is a critical review of David Rodiger's The Wages of Whiteness, very important, and I think people might want to look at it. Could you tell me quickly what he said about Rodiger? Yeah, he, he challenges a few things. He, he challenges Rodiger's uh, deferring to Winthrop Jordan in terms of an unthinking decision. He challenges Rodiger on um, the working class pre, was non-existent pre-1820, essentially, is what Rodiger argues, and he challenges Rodiger, but how, I'll do this at the end if you want, I got a lot of slides, and, and, and he challenges Rodiger that the, the, it was competition which drove European white workers, as Rodiger would call them, to the anti-white supremacist attacks, and Allen says, no, it's not competition, there's always competition in capitalism, it's, it's all the, the white supremacist influences uh, that are aff affecting and impacting people. Going on, uh, I have this article, The Developing Conjuncture and Some Insights from Harrison and Allen, free, when you go to my webpage, it's at the top left. It's got a number of pages on statistics. I just put out a quick summary, but what you'll find is it lays out how the gap between rich and poor is at record proportions and worsening. Poor and working people are suffering deeply very important comparisons with other advanced capitalist countries show how poorly workers in this country. This is to counter the notion that people are benefiting from this system, right? And the last one, of course, the one which brings us all here and we're all very clear on also, is that each and every issue we look at is shaped in a white supremacist fashion. So those statistics, I, there was one or two academics in the crowd, I don't think there are too many, but this article was originally written for a journal called um, Daedalus, the American Academy of the Arts and Science. They advertised it for three quarters and then they pulled it because they, <laughs> they didn't, so I expanded it. But you might find that story of interest. What's the name of that uh, publication that's available? This one. The developing, it's right on the top left of my webpage. It's also in a journal called Cultural Logic. And what's important about this, again, I'm just trying to encourage people and point them where they can go. This article is the fullest treatment of the development of Allen's thought. 
from the 19, particularly from the 1965 when he pioneers white skin privilege for the next 40 years, analysis and work on white privilege. And he gets into gender, he gets into a host of things. So you want to take a look at this article uh, if you get a chance. All right, so here's the expanded edition, The Invention of the White Race. A few points in what I'm going to say today is going to take some of the discussion we've had to places people haven't quite gone yet, so <laughs> bear with me. All right. Um, Please pay attention. Alan's very precise with his words. Volume one, racial oppression and social control. And I'll just say one thing before there was some passing reference to the theory and national oppression. But Alan comes out of that tradition, but by 1974, he's distinguishing between racial and national oppression. This is very important for people interested in that history. Social control, crucial to understanding what develops. And his last one, origin. He uses origin in the singular, the origin of racial oppression. And here's why. He says, in choosing the subtitle, I meant it to be consistent with the argument of the book. Class struggle was the origin of racial oppression. And he gets in and elaborates that. All right. Uh, this is a fellow, Carl Davidson, some of the old timers might know, but he's been around and he knew Alan way back. But what he says here, and if you go to my webpage, on Harrison and Alan, I have all kinds of comments from activists and scholars on the importance of their work. People you've read, you know. But Davidson, what he says here, I think is, is on point. You have to work to get through these two volumes, but once you do, it will change your life and outlook forever. You simply can't understand America with, uh, and who we are without this book. So that's kind of high praise, I think. Davidson. Carl Davidson. A lot, a lot of people read Forsyth, right? Right. He comes up yeah, and online. Right, and he does online University of the Left and a number of other things. He's very active still, and, but he was a big SDS activist and many other things over his life. Okay, here's what Alan writes on the back cover of volume one of The Invention of the White Race. When the first Africans arrived in Virginia in 1619, there were no white people there, nor, according to the colonial records, would there be for another 60 years. The word white does not appear in a Virginia colonial record until 1691. But it's not simply that the word white doesn't appear. The white race, as we know it, was not functioning. And he bases this on going through 885 county years of Virginia colonial records. He was camped out in Richmond, going through all these primary sources. And I, I now have his papers, which we're looking to place at a major repository. But he's got over 1,000 pages of transcribed notes from this early period. No one else has done this. And what he's always doing is he's looking at wherever in the records laboring people had a voice, the African-American woman, the uh, uh, Dutch man, you know, the English, Irish, whatever. Um, so it's a major resource. Uh, Alan goes on to elaborate on that. Others living in the colony at the time were English. They had been English when they left England, and naturally they and their Virginia-born children were English. They were not white. White identity had to be carefully taught over the next 60 years. Didn't come naturally, right? Had to be taught. We'll get into that. Here's a case that might interest you. John Punch, 1640. Still no white people. John Punch is what's called, and I'll explain this a little more in a second, a chattel bond servant. And he escapes with two other chattel bond servants. They were limited term. They served a few years. And he escapes with Victor, a Dutchman, and a Scotchman called James Gregory, still not white, right? And John Punch, who's of African descent, gets the harshest punishment because the, the plantation owners, whenever they thought they had someone who might be vulnerable, would try and impose harsher penalties, whether it be a woman, a youth, right, ever, right? And in this case, they tried to sentence John Punch to lifetime servitude. Now, this is uh, what's of particular interest to this is, that's the only record in all the colonial records on John Punch, but John Punch, Ancestry.com, did a big piece about four years ago on John Punch because John Punch is related, it turns out, to our president, Barack Obama. But, but, it's not on his African father's side, but it's on his mother's side, right? All right. 
Bacon's Rebellion, 1676, 1677. This is a big event. I'm going to get into this in more depth. But in Bacon's Rebellion, when that, in that insurrection, the poor and working people, European and African American, fighting together, demanding their freedom from bondage. They kick out the governor. They burn Jamestown. And um, in the final stages, a ship captain was one of the people sent to put them down, and he writes, I there met 400 English and Negroes in arms, still not white, right, who were much dissatisfied. Some were for shooting me, and others were for cutting me in pieces. I told them that they all were pardoned and freed from their slavery. Most of them I persuaded to go, except in the end, 80 Negroes and 20 English would not deliver their arms. Still not white. So Allen argues this is supreme proof that the white race did not exist at that time, such solidarity, because you wouldn't see it for the next few hundred years, right? So here's the main theses of Allen's work. Please hear, bear with me, we'll go through these, but again, you'll find all this on the web page and elsewhere. The white race was invented as a ruling class social control formation in response to labor solidarity as manifested in the latter Civil War stages of Bacon's Rebellion. It's the Civil War stage, the second stage of Bacon's Rebellion, when people start coming together, right? The way it was done, a system of racial privileges was deliberately instituted by the late 17th, early 18th century Anglo-American bourgeoisie in order to define and establish the white race and to establish a system of racial oppression. And Allen goes on to argue the consequence was not only ruinous for African Americans, it was, um, but was also disastrous for European American workers. Right? And their position, he elaborates, their position in relation to the rich and powerful was not improved, but it was weakened by the white skin privilege system. So Allen is arguing the invention of the white race was political. He's arguing the white race must be understood not simply as a social construct, but as a ruling class social control formation. I want to elaborate on that. 1997, a professor in it might have been in Atlantic. I can't remember. It might have been in Atlantic. Uh, Fredrickson, who writes on South Africa and elsewhere, writes the the idea that race is a social construct is now an academic cliche. Everyone knows race is a social construct. And what Allen says is, no, that's not enough to say that. Because if you say race is a social construct and leave it there, you leave the back door open for the Dinesh D'Souza's and the Daniel Patrick Moynihan's who will argue, well, yeah, but that, that explains blacks' inferior status because of family life or, or cultural background, right? Allen says, no, 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 you don't want to leave that escape hatch for these people. You have to understand and put it right where it belongs. It's a ruling, it serves ruling class interests. Now, I come out of the labor movement, 33 years in the labor movement, postal worker, lots of things, and we did wage, always we tried to wage struggle against the bosses and putting the struggle against white supremacy is key, as central, and we have many rich experiences, but maybe some other time we can talk about that. But one of the worst things in the labor movement you can run into is a class collaborationist, a co-worker who sides with the bosses, right? There was some talk about how they get dealt with in different situations. But, but what Allen argues, yeah, the white race is an all-class association, multi-class, that's what the white race is, held together by racial privileges. The key privileges that hold it together are those conferred on laboring class European Americans. So he argues it's the most basic, prevalent, and historic form of class collaboration in this country, the white race, right? It has served as the principal historic guarantor of ruling class domination of national life. It's what they turn to. He says white supremacism is the Achilles heel of the labor, democratic, and socialist movements. White identity is the main barrier to class consciousness in the US. Right, we're gonna get into this more because this takes it a little deeper. Okay, now we're going to do a segue from Hubert Harrison, and then we're getting into Alan Deep. But Harrison helps explain Alan. And yesterday, I, as I said, I was so stimulated by what I heard and the, some of the people I spoke with, but I realized many people here were not familiar with Hubert Harrison, and it's unfortunate because he is a giant of our history, right? 
So Hubert Harrison lives from 18, and I'm only doing a few slides, but on the webpage you can find hours worth, you know, and videos. But he's a brilliant intellectual, a race and class conscious radical internationalist. He is known as the father of Harlem radicalism. That ta phrase was given to him, that term, that name, moniker, by A. Philip Randolph and others. And he's a key ideological link in the two wings of the civil rights black liberation struggle. Let me explain. Uh, and also on these, now I'm, I've got over there on the table, this is volume one of my two volume biography on Harrison. It's Columbia University Press, it's over 600 pages. If you get a chance to look at it, it's got wonderful reviews, again, by activists and, and, and scholars you'll be familiar with, I think. Um, and it's over 600 pages, it's 116 pages of notes, 60 pages of photos with detailed captions, and it's volume one. It is the first, it's, I'm working on volume two now, trying to finish it. It'll be the first multi-volume biography of an Afro-Caribbean and only the fifth of an African-American after Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, Langston Hughes, and Martin Luther King Jr. He is a giant of black history. Um, I, we have over there a reader which has 138. I plan to get out all 700 of his articles. He dies young at 44, right? So he's prolific. Uh, and this book just came out recently, within the last few months I did. Uh, it's a Harrison's book, When Africa Awakes. It's the inside story of the stirrings and strivings of the New Negro Movement in the Western world. New Negro Movement, if you read the standard text, they'll associate it with Alain Locke, 1925. This is eight years earlier. It's rooted in social and political activism. And, um, and uh, the, uh, I, uh, I thought I had one more slide there. Um, and what's important, this new Negro movement is not, when it's portrayed in the later stuff, it's treated mostly as a literary movement, but this was a militant social activist movement, much like the black power movement of the 60s. And when you read about it in the volumes, you'll see what I'm talking about. Oh, just a, as, an well, as an anecdote, uh, this little, that's a tricolor flag of Harrison's organization, the Liberty League, black, brown, and yellow. He wrote, because that's the colors we are domestically and internationally. From the black, brown, and yellow, Marcus Garvey, who followed Harrison, was a follower of Harrison, switched to the red, black, and green, which people are familiar with today. Um, going on. Here's J.A. Rogers, World's Great Men of Color. Book has gone through about eight, I think, reprint editions. And if you read theroot.com, people go online and read The Root, uh, Henry Louis Gates has been doing a series based on J.A. Rogers for about the last year and a half. Um, and it's a uh, hundred amazing facts about the Negro. But J.A. A. Rogers says that Hubert Harrison was perhaps the foremost Afro-American intellect of his era. That's extraordinary praise. And that's amidst chapters on Booker T, William Monroe Trotter, you know, people like that. So he's an uh, intellectual giant. A. Philip Randolph call, calls him the father of Harlem radicalism. Hubert Harrison is, I believe, the only person in United States history to play leading signal roles in the largest class radical and the largest race radical movement of his day. He's the foremost black organizer, agitator, and theoretician in the Socialist Party around its 1912 heyday. He's the founder of the first organization, the Liberty League, and the first newspaper, the voice of the new Negro movement, and later becomes principal editor of Marcus Garvey's Negro World when that paper sweeps the globe. And the Garvey movement, by one, its leading scholar, Robert A. Hill, says is very clearly a component part of the new Negro movement. Uh, so here's, uh, again, Harrison. He edits the paper, 1917, 1919. He edits a publication called The New Negro, 1920. His book, Locke, is later. Here's The New Negro, Harrison's publication, 1919, six years before Locke. Women of Our Race, Education in West Africa, White War and the Colored wor Workers, Two Negro Radicalisms, right? He is a radical internationalist. He's extremely knowledgeable on Africa, Asia, Mideast, America, and Europe. Winston James, an outstanding scholar today, points out that Hubert Harrison wrote and spoke more knowledgeably about Africa than any of his contemporaries, but he did so without the arrogance that so often comes from people in this country towards people from Africa. Um, he writes on the Mideast and, and many developments there in terms of Islam. He spoke, or, although he's self-educated, he spoke or read to some degree six languages, including Arabic. In his last years, he was teaching himself Arabic and reading the Quran, not because he was religious, he was a free thinker, but because it was a religion of so many people of African descent. I have scholars 
from India writing me saying that what Harrison writes on India in the period around World War I is the best they see coming out of this country. 1926, when he's still alive, he never went to college a day in his life, but he delivers a series of lectures at NYU and at Columbia on the Canton Uprising, right? So um, he profoundly influenced the generation of new Negroes. In my books, I argue, and no one has seriously challenged amongst his generation, He's the most class conscious of the race radicals and the most race conscious of the class radicals. And he emphasized, he, the common people, he lives, and uh, someone spoke yesterday, and I, I really appreciated her point. Harrison lives at 231 West 134th Street. It's the most densely populated block in Harlem. He is of the people. He's not on high, right? Um, a. Philip Randolph. Harrison was, by, by various accounts, including Randolph, the major radical influence on A. Philip Randolph. He was the major radical influence on Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey joins Harrison's organization. Anyone familiar with Marcus Garvey knows he doesn't join anyone else's organization, <laughs> right? All right. And if, if we take those lines of descent down, it's Martin and Malcolm, because it's Martin who marches on Washington with uh, Randolph at his side, and it's Malcolm whose father is a Garveyite preacher and whose mother is a reporter for the Negro World, the same paper that Harrison had been uh, editor of, right? So I argue he's a key ideological link in these two wings, very important wings of the civil rights black liberation struggle. Okay, now just a few, few things on maybe seven, eight more slides that are going to lead right to Allen. Harrison arrives from St. Croix, the Virgin Islands, it was Danish West Indies at the time, in 1900. And he encountered a vicious white supremacy unlike anything he knew previously. He, he and other uh, Afro-Caribbeans coming to the US often commented on it. And Harrison was shocked. When he arrives in New York, New York City, according to Harper's Magazine, had just undergone its fourth great, what they called, race riot. And it was said a black person couldn't walk between 42nd Street and 59th Street without fear of being seized by a mob. That same year, there are at least 107 African Americans lynched in this country. Here's four at one time in Georgia, right? Um, Claude McKay, as I said, Harrison comments on this. Harrison used the word shocked when he writes a letter published in the New York Times. Garvey comments on it. Claude McKay phrases it very well. He goes, when I came to the US, it was the first time I had ever come face to face with such manifest, implacable hatred of my race. And my feelings were indescribable. I, heard of, uh, I had heard of prejudice in America, but never dreamed of it being so intensely bitter. I want to briefly explain the difference from what Harrison knew in St. Croix and what he encountered in the US, because this is important for us understanding what we're up against. In, Hank, in St. Croix, during Harrison's use and going back during slavery, but in Harrison's use, there's no history of lynch terror. There's no formal segregation. Class promotion amongst a sector of the African population was fostered. Harrison was born on a plantation owned by two men of color. You wouldn't find that down south for the most part. And white supremacy was not as virulent or as vicious as in the US. In St. Croix, here's some of the reasons why. That's what he encounters. Now, in St. Croix, of the 100% of the population, 5% were European, essentially at the top of the society. 80% of the population were black, essentially plantation laborers. And 15% were so-called colored of mixed European and African descent. The 5% couldn't control the 95%, so they tried to utilize the 15% to help maintain social control. This brings us to you know, one of those topics Alan's going to talk about. So it was for social control reasons that the uh, European elite implemented a policy of some promotion. And so here's what, the, here's what went on in St. Croix. It was a policy of promotion and land holding. As I mentioned, Harrison's born on a plantation owned by people of color. The principal instrument of social control in St. Croix was the militia. The key component was the free coloreds, right? And here's this last one. In 1834, free coloreds were extended an edict of full equality, a law that said at least nominally Europeans and free coloreds were equal in various things. Compare it to the US. The general policy was one of severe racial proscription. 
Slave patrols to maintain control were lily white. And Negroes, as codified in the Dred Scott decision, had no rights that a white was bound to respect. So that's a marked contrast. And we, we'll get into this more. Harrison, as I said, is a leading black activist in the Socialist Party. In 1912, 100 years ago, He's laying out in a major theoretical journal of the party, and he does series, the first major ones by a black activist, on the Negro and socialism. But he's very clear the duty of the, party, the socialist party is to champion the cause of the Negro. Right? Um, this is for the younger generation, because there were some allusions to the list the last few days. Occupy Wall Street. We all remember that, right? Here's Hubert Harrison, according to the New York Times in 1912. Hubert Harrison, an eloquent and forceful Negro speaker, shattered all records for distance in an address on socialism in front of the Stock Exchange building yesterday. His voice carried to the furthermost limits, and the crowd was still going strong at the beginning of the third hour. He had this vast crowd occupying Wall Street in 1912. So it's a little more history that people might want to refer to as they continue their work. Here, he's active in the labor movement. He does labor organizing for various unions, but the major labor struggle in 1913 was the Patterson Silk Strike in areas with people some of you may be familiar, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, Big Bill Haywood, and some of the wobbly IWW organizers. East St. Louis, pe people are talking about uh, you know, recent mass killings and stuff, but there was, uh, in East St. Louis in July of 1917, uh, a situation inflamed by the labor movement. Samuel Gompers and a fellow named Carter, who was president of one of the Railroad Brotherhoods, started inflaming the situation about black workers coming north to take white men's jobs, right? That, that was, and Harrison goes, what, what a white men's job, right? And um, in this situation, in this picture, a black man's being attacked by a mob of angry whites while the National Guard stand by and do nothing. But here's what's interesting and relevant, again, for the younger generation regarding East St. Louis. It is 12 miles from Ferguson, yes. right? And Harrison calls a meeting, calls a meeting to protest. Because in East St. Louis, the estimates of the uh, number of African Americans killed is 39 to 250. Harrison calls a meeting in Harlem on 132nd Street Thousand people turn out to protest just as after Ferguson in New York we had mass demonstrations. But there's history again to so much of this stuff that we do well to learn from. And he gets pretty militant because the Times is quoting him about an eye, oh, we'll take an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and he's talking arm, militant arm struggle. Now, ordinarily when I say the next thing, I pull out of my pocket a black stone I have. It's called a touchstone. But if you don't remember anything else from today's presentation, Try to remember this one, the touchstone. A touchstone is a black stone. You, if you have a metal that you think is gold, you rub it against the touchstone to see if it's really the gold it's purported to be. So Harrison writes in 1911 in the Socialist Party Press, politically the Negro is the touchstone of the modern democratic idea. The presence of the Negro puts our democracy to the test and reveals the falsity of it. It is an extraordinary metaphor. Any issue we look at in society, housing, employment, incarceration rates, health care, pick an issue, let's put it to the test. How are black people faring? What are we going to do about it? It's a guide for political action, which is one of the things that we here today are all coming together around. Remember that touchstone. He goes on in the same passage to say that true democracy and equality implies a revolution startling to even think of. And I have no doubt that that, sen that sentiment foreshadows the <laughs> 1960s when the civil rights black liberation struggle is a catalyst for all these other movements for social change. The anti-war movement, student movement, women's movement, gay and lesbian rights, labor movement. They all take sustenance from the civil rights black liberation for two main reasons, I think. Other reasons, too, but two main ones. The cause was just, and it hits so directly at how the ruling class maintains social control. OK, here's where we take Harrison. Here's where we foreshadow Harrison. I mean, Allen again, but we see this in Du Bois also. Harrison, in 1912, again in the leading socialist journals, argues that the 10 million Negroes of America form a group that is more essentially proletarian, working class, right? Uh, and under slavery, they were the most ex thoroughly exploited of the American proletariat. So he views enslaved black labor as proletarian. 
W.E. Du Bois, 1935, writes a book which reshapes a lot of people's interpretation of U.S. history, and he makes a similar point. He goes, yet the white labor movement, with few exceptions, never realized the situation. It never had the intelligence or knowledge to see in black slavery and reconstruction the kernel and meaning of the labor movement. Allen argues, understanding enslaved black labor as proletarian does several things. It provides us some of the most heroic examples in labor history of struggles. It helps to tear the covers off white labor's betrayal of black labor. Well, yeah, they're, they're somehow different, right? They're, they're, you know, they're not workers like we are and all that. And very important, Allen argues, it helps to understand the invention of the white race as a ruling class social control formation. So Harrison winds up leaving the Socialist excuse me, Party, um, and he's going to found the New Negro Movement. When he leaves the Socialist Party, he offers what I say is arguably the most profound but least heated criticism in the history of the left in this country. He writes, the Socialist Party, like the labor movement, has insisted on the white race first and class after, that it put the white race first before class. That leads us directly to Theodore W. Allen and what is the white race. But all these slides that I'm, sh I'm throwing up, I assure you, in those texts there are lots of documents and footnotes <laughs> which back up and point you to the original sources. So here we go to Allen now. Allen starts working on what becomes the invention of the white race. It's in the 1960s. He's got that rich history of left activism and he's living in Brooklyn and he's, been, uh, he's fascinated with history, relates to the common people, he knows racial discrimination is bad, but it's a changed atmosphere. Civil rights struggle, anti-imperialist struggles, and he starts really thinking more deeply, could it be possible that key defeats suffered by the f democratic, progressive, and socialist movements could be found in white supremacism? So he wants to look at this more deeply. And he's influenced by Du Bois, right? And so in 1965, he set about to investigate three great social crises, civil war and reconstruction, the populist revolt of the 1890s, and the Great Depression of the 1930s. And um, uh, he also, while he's doing that, is addressing deeper issues. Why the l relatively low level of class consciousness in this country? Why no significant socialist party? Why no significant labor party? Anything like that. The questions we're all grappling with today. And uh, he took on what he considered to be the old consensus of explanations from left and labor historians. I'm doing this very quickly, but again, if we have it videoed, you can take your time with it later. Um, so he goes through architects of a consensus, a six-pronged rationale in there. Look at them angles. It's Foster, head of the Communist Party. It's labor historians, John Commons. It's general historians, Charles and Mary Beard. The six prongs that they try and articulate as the reason to explain all this, uh, early right to vote, the heterogeneity of the working class, freelance safety. He goes through all six and he argues basically that each one is more myth than reality. The free land wasn't going to laboring people, the railroads are getting it. Heterogeneity may have actually helped you know, the class consciousness. You know, you had people coming. And he goes through all and he goes, whatever their effects on European American workers, the uh, same can't be said their effect on black workers. And he countered with his own theory that white supremacy was the main retardant of class consciousness. And he understood white privilege, that racial, radical social change should challenge white supremacy and white skin privilege. He understood white privileges as a poison bait. And for someone today who asked the question, what about some slogans? He offers a few. Did he all tried and true from the labor movement? One of them. An injury to one is an injury to all. But this is a little addition he added on this one. Solidarity forever means privileges never. All right. Privileges are a poison bait, like a shot of heroin. All right. Two essential points he makes about race privilege policy. It is deliberate bourgeois policy. This doesn't spring up from below and just happen. It's coming. They're, driving. They're the driving force. And contrary to surface appearance, it's not in the interest short range or long term. And Allen, with his background, explains workers' interest in a phrase some of you might be familiar with, but the national struggles point out and bring to fore the common interest of the working classes of all nationalities and in the various stages of development, uh, always and everywhere represent the interest of the movement as a whole, the class conscious, truly class conscious, the entire class. 
He, this is what he does. Another thing he writes in this period, and I'm just calling to your attention. We're not going to get into it deeply, but I hope you get a chance to go look it up online because these are issues that you people here will be dealing with today. He writes on, and when Allen raises issues, he's got great intellectual integrity, so he raises issues and tries to address them fair, you know, fairly, you know, not take cheap shots. And he's addressing the question, oh, sorry, excuse me. Um, the five artful dodges of white radicals on the issue of the centrality of the fight against white supremacy, why it can't be primary. And here's what he characterizes those five arguments back then as the five, five key articles. Level up, don't level down. Can't take anything away from the white work, you know. And of course, that's not gonna, if you're not going to challenge the privileges, the privileges aren't going to end, right? Uh, the new working class, those who have skills and stuff, aren't in direct competition with the, the uh, regular workers, so it's going to be different. And so we don't have to spend so much time on that. The immediate interest of the white workers are in conflict. With, uh, uh, with those of the Negro, but the long-term interests are the same. Therefore, we need parallel struggles, right? Um, for eventually, when the Depression comes, oh, then we'll come together, you know, blah, blah, blah. And number five, number five, which was also current then and is current today in some circles, don't waste time on the U.S. workers. They're bought off, you know, and uh, support national liberation, things like that. So he goes through, and then he addresses them. So I encourage people to go look and see what he writes. Uh, Okay, now on the three previous crises, the first time I saw Alan speak was in 1969, on the same age as some of the people here. And what I heard there stayed with me for the next however many years, 40 some odd, right, or whatever. Um, he argues in the three periods of national crisis characterized by general confrontations between capital and the urban and rural laboring classes, the key to defeat was in each case by ruling a class appeals to white supremacism by fostering white skin privileges amongst laboring class European Americans. I'm going to shorten this by only going to the Depression 30s, which was talked about briefly today. But here we go. And I come out of the labor movement again. So a fellow at Columbia, Ira Katz Nelson, has written a book when a, a affirmative action was white. And he basically argues very effectively that each and every federal program from the 1930s into the 1960s was shaped in a white supremacist fashion. And why, as was alluded to today, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president, his base of support had three main prongs. It had the trade unions, it had the corrupt urban political machines, and it had those Dixiecrats down south, which people were talking about today, who shaped so much of the policy. So we take a look at labor legislation. And labor, again, labor legislation, Social Security until 1951, the National Labor Relations Act uh, and the Fair Labor Standards Act all excluded domestic and agricultural workers. That's 70% of your black and Latin workforce, right? By design, that's how they're set up. Uh, emergency relief, it was federal money, but it was controlled locally. Extraordinary disparities, particularly down south. Um, Last two are very important, I think. One, the GI Bill. GI Bill, you can get a house with zero down payment and low interest loan. The statistics for the New York, North Jersey area where I live are 67,000 GI loans awarded, less than 100 go to families of color. That's how you get the ring of lily white suburbs around New York and every other city in this country. Ruling class design. <coughs> Another one of major importance, and we in the labor movement, I think, should be paying far more attention to, and maybe as things develop, that'll happen, right, is the black to white unemployment ratio. Everybody's familiar with the black to white unemployment ratio, two to one, some close variant of it. But it wasn't always that way. In 1929, at the start of the Great Depression, the black to white unemployment ratio was one to one, which makes sense if you think about it, because black people were brought here to labor, right? But by 1947, after all the programs of the New Deal and the post-war redeployment, the ratio was two to one, and that's all virtually anyone in this room has ever known. Right? So Allen argues, again, in this period, the most vulnerable point, because one of the questions this group wants to address is strategy. And he argues the key for strategy is understanding 
that the most vulnerable point at which a decisive blow can be struck in this country is against, uh, against bourgeois rule is white supremacy. It is what they rely on and what we, what we got to beat them on and what we can beat them on, the most vulnerable point. Um, here's something very interesting and you might find because this talks about, it refers a little bit to the current climate. People have been asking that question. He, po he says, well, if we, t if we step back and take a look, in general, labor struggle the, the, in the U.S. could be interpreted as a five-stage sa cycle. Normal course of capitalist events, deterioration of conditions for the workers. At a certain point, the substance of the white workers' privileges begins to get eroded. Then, the white workers manifest a tendency, come, let's come together, brothers and sisters, we got something in common. What has then happened traditionally is the ruling class moves to resubstantiate the white race privileges, and unfortunately, historically, in the past, the white workers have taken that poison bait, right? Now, what Alan argues is we struggle against white supremacy in all those stages, but very key is between three and five when we're coming together and we can build off that, right? All right. Um, and he emphasizes in that period, keep in mind, and this is what we're here about, the importance, and I hate to use this word, hegemony, but Alan <laughs> used it. Well, it's not me, it's not me. But he says, the need to maintain anti-white supremacist proletarian hegemony in mass struggles, and that's what this group represents, working class leadership is what we're trying to encourage and build, right? Okay, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so here's Alan going back to the history of his book. So Alan's working on these three crises, and what happens is a fellow named Winthrop Jordan comes out with a book, White Over Black, American Attitudes Towards the Negro, 1550 to 1812. You can see by the title that Jordan equates white with American, right? And uh, this book is the ideological response from the universities to the civil rights black liberation struggle. And the core of what Jordan argues is that white supremacy is just naturally the way white people are. Racism is innate, right? So Allen, as he sets about, he wants to go, that, this is what prompts him to go back to the 17th century to address that argument because he thinks it's, it's central to so much. But the two arguments that Allen's going to take on in his work, two pre key articles, are one, the idea that racism is innate, and the second, the idea that white workers benefit, right? So the first one is associated with Jordan. The second one is Morgan, who I mentioned earlier, Edmund Morgan, who writes about 17th century, 18th century Virginia. And this is the one, again, Michelle Alexander uses. But Morgan makes the argument that there were too few free, poor European uh, Americans on hand to matter in the 18th century. That's not true. It's, it's factually not true. And um, you know, it's as if they're all getting promoted up out of the class. That is the case in St. Croix, Jamaica, Barbados, the Anglo-Caribbean, for reasons which Alan goes into, but that's not the class here. So now we're going to go into volume one, and we'll do volume two, and we'll wrap it up real quick. <laughs> OK. This is food for thought. Alan writes in his acknowledgments to volume one, first I acknowledge my obligation to two fellow proletarian in intellectuals, Charles Johnson, African-American, and William Carlotti, Italian-American, who cleared away my ideological barnacles and taught me to say, I am not white. Food for thought. Okay, Alan sees, and he writes about this, nothing positive in the white race. He says it's a ruling class social control formation. He, you, the question is, what are you gonna do with these white workers? He tries to talk to them as workers, emphasize their worker, not their white, right? And he, he explained the white race is now and always has been nothing other than a bourgeois social control formation. He considered the special obligation of the European worker to act by resigning from the white race, joining the human race, if you will, a born again proletarian, free of the incubus, the devil of white identity. He added that resigning does not entail entering some other racial or nationality group you remain a European American, right? But again, food for thought. Purpose of volume one is to free the conceptual groundwork of the white blind spot, of just thinking of race in terms of phenotype and innate and all that stuff. So what he does, he opens up by reviewing a lot of the history on the relationship of slavery and racism. 
uh, of all the historians, he breaks them into two groups, psychocultural, Winthrop Jordan, et cetera, socioeconomic, the Oscar and Mary Hanlon, Edmund Morgan, Eric Williams, Timothy Breen. He clearly sides with those on uh, socioeconomic, but he has some differences with them on various points, which are well worth reading for those interested in this. Of all the historians writing on this period, the one he, li he likes most and is very similar to in all the analysis is Lerone Bennett, Jr. People not familiar with Bennett, he's senior editor of Ebony Magazine for many years. Before the Mayflower is a book people may have read, his book Shaping of Black America really deals with this and he makes the same three arguments essentially that Allen does. Um, then Allen looks at some of the howling absurdities of race. He talks about how in colonial Latin America there was a, a tradition in some, in some places for purchasing a royal certificate of whiteness. In Brazil it says money whitens, no such whitening in the U.S. Here's another example, 1890, Portuguese siblings, they come. Uh, one comes to British Guiana, right, uh, current Guyana, and another goes to, comes to the U.S. And the one going to uh, British Guiana would learn that he or she was not white, whereas the one coming to the U.S. would learn that they are white. Cuba, this is a nice one, 1907, same year. Spanish are out, they still got their last census that they're completing, the U.S. has moved in. In Cuba, Mexican Indians and Chinese were classified as white by the Spanish. U.S. comes and says, that's not the way we do things, right? And they're classified as colored, that's back then, it's been, right? Um, Virginia laws, and people may be familiar with this, all the torturous definitions of what constitutes a Negro, one-fourth, one-sixteenth, one drop, and so on. Um, in the face of such absurdities, Allen says, let's take a closer look at the nature of the oppression. Let's analyze racial oppression as we would analyze gender oppression, class oppression, national oppression. Let's look at the characteristics of it. Um, and. Um, so he, he does that and he, he, he thinks it provides firmer footing and he wants to get away from the phenotype, the skin color based understanding of racial oppression. So he describes some characteristics of racial oppression, reduction of all members to an undifferentiated social status, some <coughs> other defining characteristics, declassing legislation, all this is again online, deprivation of civil rights, uh, legalization of literacy and displacement of family rights, current day, we still have many aspects of this today, just updated, right, right. Um, and the first of subject, but he's also not only going to look at um, the nature of the oppression, but how they're able to maintain it, how they're able to set it up. And that's the social control aspect, racial oppression and social control. Um, so what he does is very interesting. He looks in the Irish mirror and he looks at the history of Ireland and many people here might not be familiar with it. I was not so familiar with the history of Ireland, but it's fascinating in the way the British treated the Irish, right? And he argues, and I think it's rather convincing, so I encourage you to look at it, that uh, Irish history presents a case of racial oppression without reference to skin color, or, or, or as the jargon goes, phenotype, because the uh, English and the Irish, same skin color, if you will, right? Um, so Allen maintains that a comparative study of Anglo-Norman, which goes way back, but Protestant ascendancy in Ireland and white supremacy in continental uh, Anglo-America demonstrates that racial oppression is not dependent on differences in skin color. You can have racial oppression without it, right? Um, he says the essential elements existed in both places. He goes through that. Uh, he also distinguishes between <laughs> racial oppression and national oppression. Now in the left there was this history, as was alluded to earlier today, of national oppression de de uh, derived uh, from uh, Soviet nationality theory. But Allen's going to distinguish between racial oppression and national oppression. And one of the key differences is where does the group that helps maintain social control come from? And in racial oppression it's from the oppressor group, but in national oppression sector of the oppressed group that is promoted. And that, that's how he, one of the things. So he argues in Virginia, uh, persons of discernible non-European ancestry were denied a result, uh, role in the co social control buffer, whereas in the Car Caribbean, mulattoes were included in the social control group. One of the key reasons has to do with demographics and class struggle, and also down in the Caribbean, I mean, it's capital production, uh, it's sugar production, more capital intensive, there's a host of reasons which Allen goes into. Um, 
He also talks about how racial oppression can change to national oppression, as we see in Ireland around 1800, and as we see in the Anglo-Caribbean. So this is really looking, you know, a social, uh, socioeconomic approach to these issues. Um, he talks about the Irish sea change. This is very fascinating. He talks about how the Irish who hate the British with a passion for, because of the oppression they faced, uh, come to the U.S. and in a matter of generations, uh, they, you know, in, in Ireland, they're opponents of slavery and supporters of abolition. Within a couple generations here in the U.S., they become opponents of abolition and supporters of slavery. But he's not blaming it at the bottom because he identifies the forces which are really uh, pushing that. And they include the plantation elite and related financial interests. The mayor of New York, a fellow named Fernando Wood, was tied in very much with the slaveocracy. He talks about the Catholic Church hierarchy and its role and Tammany Hall. He, we're closing, we're ending volume one and we'll get into the meat of this volume two in one second. So he talks about how um, after emancipation, the ruling elite opts for white reconstruction. Again, they decided to maintain social control. They're gonna use the same system that had been used in the South. And key ingredients are free, uh, excuse me, uh, free land, immigration, and industrial employment. And by industrial employment, this brings it back to North Carolina a little, talking about the, the lily white textile industry, the cotton textile industry, and things like this, right? Cotton mill campaign. So he ends volume one, and what he's done is a host of very interesting things. He's shown religio racial oppression against the Irish, national oppression in the Anglo Caribbean, racial oppression in, in continental Anglo America, that's the South and how racial oppression can be transformed. So it's a deep understanding of social forces. Here's volume two. This he considered his life's work, this volume right here. 30, most of his 30 years was spent on this. He focuses on certain key dates, 16, uh, it's for, and it covers the period 1607 to 1750. 1622, crucial, and most people not familiar with, reduction of labor to chattel labor status, Bacon's Rebellion, and then when they start codifying the laws in 1705. So he reviews the background, England's background, and points out that England was in the, in the lead in developing agricultural capitalism way back in the 1500s and 1600s. And this is crucial for understanding what develops here. But he also points out, and people may not be familiar with this, the English attempted to impose slavery on their own English vagabonds in the period 1547 to 1550. That was beat back. And they also imposed slavery on Scottish salt pan workers and coal miners for almost two centuries, right? So they're not, as Alan knew, he's a coal miner. He knew. They, they, they care less. Who, you know, what, you know they, they, they want to get their money and they'll, they'll do it, right? So uh, the struggle in England results, the class struggle in England results in the Statute of Artificers in 1563, which is a basic labor law in England, which exists for 250 years, and is what the colonists bring to Virginia. That's why this is important. And it holds that there would be no slavery and laborers would be paid wages, right? No, Virginia is supposed to be set up no slavery. Um, the, uh, he goes into the common problems of uh, European colonizing interest, they wanted to look for uh, how they would uh, secure a supply of labor and how they would establish social control, and in both cases, what develops in Virginia. And, and he's using Virginia as the, because it's the pattern-setting colony. Seven of our first 12 presidents come from Virginia, right? Founding fathers. He discusses Euro-Indian relations throughout the Americas and certain particularities in terms of whether it's a continental colony, social stratification, how um, the, the Spanish could come and take advantage of the hierarchy of the uh, Aztecs and Incas, you know, to uh, put them to work and maintain control, population density. But the key difference, and this is crucial for understanding that virulent white supremacy that develops here, is England alone of all the European colonizing powers was exporting European labors. This is crucial, the demographics, right? So. He talks about African migration to the Americas and points out what people may not be familiar with, that more Africans than Europeans come to the Americas between 1500 and 1800. 
He also points out the role of African resistance and key keys in on the Haitian Revolution, its impact on the British West Indies, the US, Cuba, and Brazil. And he also makes the very important point that it was from Haiti that Simon Bolivar twice goes to regroup before he goes on his liberation efforts in Latin America. So it brings those ties and connections together. Allen discusses the Virginia car, uh, Charter. It's set up, it's Congress supposed to have all the rights you know, that they had in England. Um, it's capitalist basis, he goes through you know, stocks, you know, what people owned and all that. It's clearly capitalism, and why I'm emphasizing this, it's not simply the relations of production which he goes into and the financial interest, but it's not feudalism. Some people would say, you know, this is a feudal carryover. We're talking capitalism. Um, plantations were capitalist enterprises, production monopolized by one class. They start developing the plantations in between 1610 and 16, after 1614, 1616. Um, the Powhatan, the Native Americans in the area of Jamestown were well provisioned in the first decade or two, uh, the preponderance of force. Uh, the English lacked the preponderance of force to you know, really do very much in terms of pushing them out or anything like that. In the early period, there's some intermediate forms of uh, bond servitude uh, that the uh, plantation elite, they start bringing convicts, vagrants, maids for wives, and duty boys. This is 1618, this is before the first Africans still, right? First Africans come 1619, he discusses that. Whatever their status was on the high seas, when they get to Virginia, they're not slaves because there's no slavery in Virginia. Um, key date, 22nd March, 1622. They don't teach this one. <coughs> on this day, the Powhatan <laughs> Indians in the area of Jamestown rise up and they kill one-third of the colonists in one day. And in the next year, another one-third die. Right? Now, and there's the struggle. Now, what this sets up is what today people would, might call uh, a shock doctrine scenario, right? Because the ruling elite seizes on the vulnerability. The main food was corn. Corn grows high, they couldn't go out more than 50 feet or something beyond the confines of the fort to get supplies. So the ruling elite who controlled the supplies started imposing a new category on laborers. There had been free laborers, apprentices, uh, tenants at half where they kept half of what they produced, all these capitalist relations to production. But after 1622, you see appearing in the records that people could be bought and sold to the heirs and they could be assigned to other people. They call it the custom of the country, and that's the phrase you see in the book. Just like they, they later, with a sneer, would refer to their peculiar institution, the slave owners, or, or how they wouldn't put it in the Constitution, you know, the slave. So they called it the custom of the country, but it was chattelization of labor, buying and selling labor, right? And Alan discusses how this happens. It's a break from the statute of artificers. It is not a feudal carryover. It's imposed as the custom of the country. Here are the statistics, and you've never seen these before. When I was in high school, I was taught about the, oh, way back there were Negro slaves and white indentured servants. They weren't white. They're not indentured. Look at these statistics. Three quarters were chattel bond laborers. That's not signing an indenture in England and willingly putting yourself in this status. This is being imposed. Allen points out such recruitment was generally coercive. Few were wholehearted volunteers. Many were kidnapped convicts, others. Right? And there's no, when I say that phrase, there also is still not slavery. There's not racial slavery yet in Virginia in this period. All right. So four chattel bond laborers, and someone raised questions. Uh, in, again, Alan gets, does a nice job on a number of gender issues, but here he talks about the denial of family life. And there was more serious penalties, particularly on women, if they're chattel bond laborer, because the owner, your owner, wants work out of you, right? And if you're getting pregnant, you're not doing it. So there were laws passed against fornication, adultery, and the penalties were invariably harsher on the women than on the men, right? Um, Women were exposed to special oppression attacks. Children were, of, uh, of chattel bond laborers were considered illegitimate. 17th century Virginia, Allen makes this point. Morgan, to a degree, makes this point. Edmund Morgan, Lerone Bennett Jr. makes this point. The conditions for European and African American bond laborers was very similar in this period. As Bennett says, it was no Garden of Eden. They were lucky if they finished three years. This was hard conditions. 
but there was much similarity in their conditions, right? Um, Yes, chattel means you could be bought and sold. But traditionally, the way it was set up, you, you would be uh, the chattel of someone. Uh, you might be, have a, a service of four. You're a woman, you might have five years, you know. They, they would do it. The Irish sometimes would do more African Americans. As we saw, they would sometimes try and extend it. But you could be bought and sold as a business proposition. I could pass you on to my children, my cousin, whatever, right? Your property. All right. Status of African Americans in the 17th century. Most people are not familiar with this. If you own property, and some did, some did, you could exercise marriage rights. You could, you, there was social mobility. Some had significant land holdings. Some were owners of European American laborers. Manifested many forms of resistance. Some could vote. And this becomes very important later. All right. So Allen argues the status of African Americans in this period was indeterminate because it's still being struggled out, right? And see, with, these, with this plantation economy, the big problem was for the elite was how they're going to maintain social control. People chattel, like they want to run away. There's lots. There's a number of attempts to uh, up uh, ins insurgents to run away. Um, very key case, getting into gender issues again, and particularly the black family, but much deeper issues too. Case of Elizabeth Key. Elizabeth Key is a woman, a child of a European American father and an African American mother. She was scheduled to complete her servitude when the estate she was bonded on sought to impose permanent lifetime st uh, status on her. Elizabeth Key goes to court because she could go to court back then. This changes, right? She goes to court. That's a rendition of Elizabeth Key. And she makes two arguments. One, that she had been baptized. Sometimes that one would work. Not always, right? Sometimes. But the second argument is crucial. She argues the common law principle. The, the, the law in England for centuries was the status of the child followed that of the status of the father. The Latin phrase, not Latin, partus secretor patrum. The status of the child follows that of, of the father. For, for centuries, this was the law. And if those principles prevailed, we wouldn't have had what later developed because the offspring of these, the, of these chattel laborers would be not chattel laborers, right? If it went after the father or... But in 1662, the Virginia Assembly realized, boy, that's not the way we, we want to start taking this thing, and they changed the law, and um, they go to partis sequitur venture, and the status of the child follows the status of the mother. Now, that's key also. When I was in school years ago, there was a book by a fellow named Gutman, I think it was Gutman, The Black Family in Slavery and Freedom. And that book starts in 1790. But you can't really address this issue if you don't go back and look at some of this stuff. All right. So Allen's arguing in this period still the white race did not exist. He emphasizes the invention of the white race cannot be ascribed to demands by European labor. Americans. They weren't demanding Africans being enslaved or anything like this. They're, you know, so it's coming from on high. He discusses the, the uh, trade in African labor. Another factor why there were so many English coming is because the Dutch were controlling the trade from Africa, and the trade routes would go to the Caribbean, but they're not coming up to Virginia particularly. So the numbers of European chattel bond laborers continued. Here in this period, 1680, 70, 30,000 uh, European Americans came, 24,000 were bond laborers. They still hadn't had the full turn to African labor yet, right? All right. Bacon's Rebellion, we went through that. That's the big struggle. Jamestown burning. The problem of social control in the wake of Bacon's Rebellion. And Bacon's Rebellion had been preceded by 10 laboring class and bond servants revolts. This issue of social control was major. The problem of social control was solved by the invention of the white race. And Allen goes through this and how it gets codified in law. The codification of white supremacy, a new social status was to be contrived. White identity to set European American laborers not only at a distance from African Americans, but also to enlist them as supporters of the plantation bourgeoisie, right? Um, so he goes through the codification of these privileges and he talks about the presumption of liberty, the right to get married. As a chattel monster, we couldn't get married. So these things, see, they were rights in England, but they're no longer rights in Virginia. But now they get extended, but as privileges, racial privileges, because they're only extended to the white, not to the Af Africans, right? 
There's also laws against free Africans, and they start imposing these, and there's, you know, barring from witness, can't serve in the militia, can't resist, uh, forbidding uh, to be owners of bond laborers, et cetera, and he lists all of these. They also, and this is crucial, I think, to this day still, they propagandize the people. They gotta teach the people their way, and they gotta teach the people in their interests. So how do they do it? In that day, the principal means of uh, mass communication were putting it on the church doors and the courthouse doors, right? And they were doing it, so they propagandized people. 1723, there's a key law passed. No free Negro, mulatto, or Indian whatsoever shall have any vote in the election. This is passed in Virginia. In England, they don't understand it. They say, well, if somebody owns property, why can't they vote, vote right? So Go Gooch, who's the governor of Virginia, breaks it down. He breaks it down, and he writes to England, and he says, we did it to fix a perpetual brand on free Negroes and mulattoes. So what Allen argues, convincingly, I think, is that it's a deliberate act by the bourgeoisie. Surely that was no unthinking decision, which is a reference to Winter Jordan, the one, the one he wants to challenge. All right, almost done. All right, now this one is important. Why the exclusion of free African Americans? And this, we have components and aspects of this today. Uh, there was a marked tendency to promote a pride of race among white people. The real reason the exclusion of African Americans was a corollary of the establishment of white identity. When you're excluding black, that goes into how you, ident how you identify and define white. The Act of 1723 also um, denies the right of self-defense to African Americans, which has devastating effects on the African American family. Allen points out that, and he goes through statistics, that the laborers were not promoted out of their class, and he goes through the statistics on that. He argues, as he ends volume two, that white race social control formation that's established in Virginia gets spread throughout the South, and then ultimately goes nationwide. His last book, in, towards a revolution in labor history is 2004, and he goes into, he wants to probe more deeply um, labor history, he, the question of white identity. He argues slavery was capitalism, all of the things which we've discussed before, but he challenges the great, what he calls the great white assumption, the unquestioning, indeed, unthinking acceptance of the white identity of European Americans as a natural attribute rather than a social construct. He emphasizes white race as ruling class social control formation. Um, he recommends taking up four struggles for the generations here today in the future. This is in his last year, 2004, before he dies. Work to show that white supremacism is not inherited. Demonstrate that white supremacism has not served the interest of the European American laborers. Account for the prevalence. How do you explain? Let's address that. And by the light of history, consider ways whereby European American laboring people may cast off the stifling incubus of white identity. And key to what Allen does in that last unfinished work is he starts U.S. labor history from the premise that black labor was proletarian. And he says, from that else, all else follows and changes, right? Um, so as we close, I encourage you to remember the insights of Hubert Harrison. Politically, the Negro is a touchstone of the modern democratic uh, idea, and true democracy and equality implies a revolution that's startling to even think of. Remember from Allen, right race created and maintained as a ruling class social control formation, principal historic guarantor of ruling class uh, domination of national life, uh, white supremacy reinforced by white privilege, the main retardant of class conscious efforts at radical social change have to take on that white supremacy. Remember the three previous crises, learn the lesson of history, let's not keep making these mistakes. We know what they're coming at us with, what they're coming at us with, you know, and we've gotta be able to beat them back on that. Remember the most vulnerable point, it's what they rely on, but it's what we can beat them on. Um, remember the five stage cycle. Remember the importance of an anti-white supremacist struggle in all stages, particularly from three through five. And remember the need for you all proletarian generation of the future that sees the leadership in these struggles to guarantee that we beat them back. Thank you very much.